everyone. Good morning, everyone. Hi, wave that you can hear me. Excellent, excellent. I'm Jean O'Toole. I'm the Executive Director of the New York Beef Council. And thank you for joining us today on this virtual tour. It's a perfect day to be inside. And thank you, Catherine and Jim, for being outside today. Um, I want to introduce quickly um, everybody that's on the call so you kind of have an idea where you are located. We're in the central New York, we're in the Rome area, that's where our office is. And Tim and Catherine are in the Cayuga County area at Union Springs, and we'll show a map in a little while of that. Um, but also on uh, watching this tour today is Herkimer Boses and Herkimer, so if you all wave a little bit, Herkimer Boses. There you go. Hey, hey guys, thanks for showing up. And uh, next is Wester Suffolk Boses in Dix Hills. Say hey, everyone. Do a quick wave to everyone. Yeah, that's not going to happen. All right, next we have Carrier Education Center in Angola, very west New York. Hey, look at you guys, all nice and sharp and white. Uh, next, we have Port Richmond in Staten Island, so we're going all the way to the other side of the state. Hey, guys. And then we're going right back to the middle of Oneida, uh, Herkimer, Madison, Boses, and New Hartford. Drove by you guys this morning. <laughs> nope, not. Why is it going to be There you are. Hello, shalom. And then, um, do we have Courtney, GST, Boses, and Wildwood, and Hornell? Oh, you guys wave. All right. That's fantastic. Um, so as we are moving forward here, again, um, today we're going to be visiting Tim Pellicott's farm. It's Cuyahoga View a Farm, and that is in... Uh, Union Springs, New York. So think of where the Finger Lakes are and you're right in that area. Uh, it's a little chilly and windy today. So please excuse any feedback that you might hear from the wind and we've asked him to talk nice and loud. Uh, and it's going to be a little difficult to kind of go outside today. So we'll show you some pictures of some things that would normally take us outside because between the, the wind and the rain. So like I said, it's really kind of nice that you're all inside and so am I very warm. Uh, let's see. So we're going to go through a few things. Please feel free to use the uh, chat group if you have any questions. There will be some Q&A after. Some of you have already... We should be able to hear. Um, we will uh, take the board from there. As I mentioned real quick, we are the New York Beef Council. We are funded by farmers like uh, Tim Pellicott. So anytime he sells a cow, we get a dollar, we keep 50 cents of that, and the other 50 cents goes to our national program. And that's where the beef is what's for dinner brand comes to play. And then here in the state, we do things like this educational aspect. Um, we also have a dietitian. There's four of us on the beef council. Catherine's on the farm. There's myself. We have a full-time dietitian and a part-time administrative assistant. So all is good that way. Is everybody still able to hear very good? Can you hear me? Wave your hands. All right. So with that, I'm going to jump on over and introduce Tim. So if we can get a, a good picture of Tim there. There's Tim Pellicott. He is owner operator of Cayuga View, uh, View Farms. And Tim, I'm going to have you take it away. Good morning, Gene. And welcome everybody to Cayuga View Farm here in Union Springs, New York. We are a registered Angus cow-calf operation, along with some commercial cow-calves. We have about 30 mama cows and the supporting young stock and heifers and some steers. Um, we concentrate on quality animals and quality um, <clears throat> stewardship to our land above and beyond quantity, I guess you could say. Um, we, we, we pride ourselves in what we've done here in the last so, five or six years. Um, this farm started with Black Angus in 1965. Um, we took it over <clears throat> from the original owner in 2012. And since then, we've made some great improvements. He was uh, kind of aging out, so <clears throat> it was time, and it was time for everything to change as <clears throat> we both work on and off the farm. Uh, we don't have any hired labor. 
Uh, my two sons assist me and my wife, and we have two young children that are at the farm too. So we'll start with uh, some of the projects. We're standing inside of a, a covered uh, barnyard and a covered manure storage that we did last year for our <coughs> grazing plan here and uh, lake quality. Um, if you saw the pictures, we're right in the heart of the Finger Lakes and we have a stream that runs through that feeds the Finger Lakes. So water quality is of the utmost importance in this area. Um, and it's tough with, with cattle and <clears throat> the manure and the byproducts to, to keep the lakes clean. So we strive to do the best job of that as possible. Um, you'll see behind me cows walking around in here. Um, this is a mixed group that we're standing in. We have pregnant mama cows. We have calves from last year, which are on the camera here behind us. Um, well, they're from this year, I should say. They're January, February calves. Yeah, <laughs> and um, along oh. with uh, some steers and, and larger heifers. We don't usually run a bull here for our, our breeding purposes. We do artificial insemination, so um, we don't have a bull on the farm right now at this time. Um, all of these cows are very docile. Um, we do show cattle. We take them and exhibit them at the New York State Fair and many other county fairs. The, the kids enjoy that competition and uh, time with their, their projects out and about in the world. So Tim, can you take a step back for us and explain exactly what a cow-calf operation means? A cow-calf operation is uh, a mama cow produces a calf every year and, and she, she gives us this calf and we raise it to the, the age of a feeder, which is 600, 700 pounds, and it stays on its mama for six months. And we, we, we take that calf and then at the point of weaning, we will market the calves to feeders. And sometimes we sell them to commercial feedlots um, to be finished as steers. And other times we will keep the, the, some of them as replacements. Uh, the average age of a cow on this farm is about 14 years. They will stay around here a long time um, and giving us about 12 calves in those 14 years. Um, they don't calve until the two year mark. So when they're two years old is when they have their first baby. Um, a lot of the ones you see behind me have not calved yet, they are younger. Uh, the one right here is, she <clears throat> is bred to calve next spring. Um, and she will be two years old in, in June. So the, the cows, the, the cows are an important part of the life cycle of the beef because without the cows, you don't get the, the steer calves and, 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 and the beef calves to raise up. So what we do is, is, is we raise those calves. We, we keep the mama cows and then we breed them over and over and, and get calves, one calf a year, and, and raise those calves up for market. Um, a cow-calf operation is, is a little, it, it's intense, but it's simple. We work closely with a vet. Uh, the health of the animals is very important. Um, you have to take care of those baby calves. You have to take care of those mama cows. Uh, we vaccinate. We, uh, we, we will treat animals if they're sick, but we try, try and strive for no sick animals. That's why we're in a barn here that has no sides on it. It's very open to the air. Um, the clean air, fresh air blows through here, and the cows breed that, uh, helping uh, eliminate any of the respiratory problems and so on and so forth that can come from an animal in a tight, closed barn. So you talked a little bit about what you do to take care of the animals. Can you do a quick, you started to mention that you have this covered barn to try to prevent runoff. What other things do you do on the farm to protect the land and surrounding area um, and make sure that this farm's sustainable? We, 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 we just implemented a grazing program and that grazing program, we, we put 40 acres of grass into the grazing program. And that 40 acres of grass is committed to these animals all summer long when they can graze. We start grazing, we, we shoot for April, but it might be May 1st. And we, we're still grazing today, but we're obviously the grass is not growing as fast as it was in June and July. So they, they eat off of the hay feeders too. Um, so with that grazing program, what we did is that is for plant health. And, and what we do is we rotate those cows around 
in about 13 to 15 different pastures, and we move them every two to three days. So in the morning, we'll go out on the four-wheeler and, and move a, a portable fence and move the cows to a fresh two to three acres of grass. Um, did not take long to train them. We were able to um, teach the cows within the first two weeks, I would say, when they heard the four-wheeler come, they knew they were getting fresh grass and they would meet me right at the gate and I could let them into the next the next piece. And what that does is it allows them to eat fresh green grass and, and the stuff they came off of gets to sit for about 30 days. And what that does to the plant health, because the plant is ultimately the, 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 um, the feed that, that grows the cattle. And if you don't take care of the plant, you won't have the cattle. So by pulling the cows off of that grass, it allows the grass to regrow, take a, I call it, it's not a dormant style, but it's, it's a break um, from the traffic of the animals, from constantly being clipped by the cows, um, and so on and so forth. We also do, uh, we, we, we mow the pastures after they go off because a cow, um, just like a, a, a kid likes the candy, so they're gonna eat the really good green grass first, and sometimes they will leave uh, mature plants and we will go in and clip them once we move them. And that's very important to have a very, it's, it's almost like a lawn. It's a very established sod base that uh, can hold up to the weight of the animals and, and hold up to the, the, the rain and the runoff. And, and Tim, there was another pretty cool project that you did um, as part of this new stewardship effort that you're doing. Can you talk a little bit about the bridge building that you we, had the um, we, we honor built, of figuring out. We built a bridge last year. We have a stream, like I said, that goes directly to the lakes that runs through the pastures. And that's a very important watershed. And that bridge, uh, I, I never thought I would build one. I built a bridge last year. It's 50 feet long, 10 feet wide, and it safely walks the cows over the water so that they don't have to, um, the, there's no manure and there's no uh, disturbance of the, the stream bed. Uh, with the with the cattle, um, because if you disturb that stream bed, the water picks up the manure and it picks up the soil that they disturb and takes it to the lake, thus contamination of the water. So with the bridge, it's really cool. It's one of the only ones really that we know of around here. It's called a floating uh, Maryland style bridge, and it, it sits uh, it's on I beams and concrete, and uh, it was quite the project to build. And uh, I probably wouldn't do it again, but it was fun when we did it. So. Um, and the good thing is the cattle love it. They walk over the bridge, they go from one side to the other. Uh, they know that on the other side of the bridge is fresh green grass and they're going. So, um, and in the meantime, we also have helped to keep the lakes clean for everybody that enjoys being out on the lakes. So, um, that is our, our ultimate goal here is stewardship of the land so that we leave something for my kids, for grandkids, everybody in the future, because if we, Take this resource and destroy it there won't be anything left and uh, we, we strive for that at this farm above and beyond anything else uh, stewardship of the land and animal health so tim right behind you we can see some cows um trying to check out this hay feeder and can you talk a little bit about the hay production besides the we grazing grow, you do here on the farm hay on that, that 40 acres too because the grass in the spring grows very fast so we will go out and we will mow that that hay for the first time, and we will round bale it into these big round bales. And we, we try for dry hay, which the cattle are eating. And uh, this provides them with the right amount of nutrients um, as far as protein and energy that, that they need to survive all winter. We also supplement with some minerals and, and uh, some other supplements. But their main feed is grass in the summer and dry hay, excuse me, in the winter. We also do a thing called baleage, but we, we, we try for dry hay first. Um, depends on the weather and mother nature. Uh, but with that, we also have cropland around here too, so we rotate that around. And, and we don't have a lot of hay ground off of the pasture because we have with 40 acres and 30 mama cows, we can get enough feed from those 40 acres in this area of New York to take care of most of those animals. So the remaining ground, we grow corn and soybeans and different crops, wheat. And, uh, other things. We, we will feed those commodities too, some of them. Fantastic. So we're going to transition here on the farm and uh, move through the barn a little bit and show you all some different parts of the farm and, and how Tim takes care of the animals here. So we're going to go ahead and relocate Gene.
All right. Um, and I'm going to have Dan go to slide five. I'm going to explain the different segments of the beef industry. Um, real quick, uh, Tim mentioned cow and heifer and steer and bull. And then he talked about cow-calf, where a cow is a female cow that has given birth, where a heifer is a female cow, cow that has not given birth. A bull is a male cow and a steer is a castrated bull. So those are the four types, you know, when you hear him talk about that. He has spoken about cow-calf where he has got mama cows, he inseminates them, they have a calf, and then he'll take care of that calf. And then what the next step is, is a stocker backgrounder. And those calves will transition um, from the milk of their mom and start eating some of the grasses. And sometimes they'll do that on the farm and sometimes they may sell them to that stocker backgrounder. And their uh, pure job is just to feed them grass. They may have the pastures where some farmers don't. Uh, after that, the, the next thing would be is the livestock auction. When that animal gets to about, oh, eight, 900 pounds, it could be about a year old, a little over a year, and it'll go to the livestock auction where it may end up going to, if you go to the next slide, Dan, it may go to a feed yard, and that's where it's gonna be finished off. It'll spend four to six months there. It'll be, be given a multitude of grains and forage and roughages, and uh, to fatten up that animal a little bit, they have plenty of room to, uh, to walk. They have food at all times. They have water at all times, access to dry areas. Um, it is really very comfortable for them. And then after that, it goes into the packing plant where some of you will be using it to create food items because you're going to be culinarians and or it goes into the retail. So um, based on all of that, uh, you have a quick uh, 101 on that whole segment, and uh, we're going to take it and go uh, to the next part of the farm. Oh, oh, are we back? You're back. Okay, so we've come into the old barn here, and this was a dairy farm years ago, and we've converted it to a beef operation to work with our cow-calf. We're standing under what you would normally see when you're driving down the roads in New York, and you see big old barns. Up above us is hay storage and straw and et cetera. But down here in the bottom part of the barn is where the cows live. This behind me is our chute. And in our chute, we, 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 we vaccinate our animals. We, we treat sick animals if we have them. Um, we keep the records, we work with the vet. Uh, the most important thing I wanna talk about is, is the vaccinations and, and the antibiotics. We do not use the antibiotics unless we have to. That is an absolute, and we, and we will do that with the vet's recommendation. Thankfully, in, in the knock on wood, this farm is very low use and uh, because of the vaccination protocol that the vet has put into place with us. And we, we bring the young calves into the shoot, as I'll show you how one comes through, and, and we'll give the shots and whatnot, and then they go out. Um, we also, if, if we have a sick one, we'll bring her in here and treat them. Um, the antibiotics are, are, are documented. We had one cow we had to treat for a sore hoof this summer, and we do not... Um, we do not send any animals with antibiotics. We write it down, work with the vet. Most of them are anywhere from 15 days to 45 days um, to make sure that the antibiotic flushes out of the animal. But we, we do not um, ship animals to market with antibiotics. If we do, um, the Food and Drug Administration will, will catch that and, and the farm could be held liable. That's why record keeping is so important as to what we did and what we used and how we administered it to the animal. So right now, Catherine, I think I will go get, a, get an animal and bring a, one of our little show heifers through to show you how it works. Fantastic, thanks, Tim. So this design, while Tim is going to grab the heifer, this design is known um, for, for being developed by Temple Grandin. If you get a chance to look up Temple, she has done amazing work in the industry to redefine the way that we handle our cattle. And this is a young heifer that's uh, pretty well, well behaved and, and tame, but Tim will talk to you a little bit about how large these animals can get and they can be extremely powerful. So that's why it's important for us to have an extremely safe way for us to handle them. She, she is in the chute right now. It's called a sweet chute with a headlock here. Nothing is hurting this animal's neck. It's, it, it closes to the size of the animal and stops. The animal can't go forward or can't back up, allowing us access to the safe spot for the vaccination, which you can't really see, but it's right behind here in the shoulder area of the animal. So we will give the shot there. We 
We will do any other treatment. If we have to redo an ear tag, we do a tag in here. Um, and this is how we work the animal safely. And this is safe for us, the, the caretaker of the animal, and the animal. Um, they can't jump around, they can't hurt you, they can't hurt themselves. And we will run the cows through here without, this is a halter. They usually don't have halters on them. They, they come through without a halter, there's somebody behind, there's two or three of us doing this, and somebody running the lever here, and we catch them. Uh, these animals with the halters are, are, are show cows, and this calf was at the New York State Fair this year, and uh, she was at a couple other fairs, so she's very tame. Um, but usually there's no halter. There's the opportunity to examine them. If we have to take the animal's temperature, we can safely take their temperature to see if she is running at temperature. Um, we can lift their feet up if we have to in here and do different things. But it, it's safe for the animal and safe for us. Um, Tim, if you had to estimate, how much does that heifer weigh right this now? This heifer right here behind us, she's a small heifer. She was born in April and she was born April 1st of this year. She's been weaned, which we'll talk about, but she weighs roughly 600 pounds. The, the, the average cow on this farm, we, we run a little bit heavier cows. We, we run about 1,400 pound cows. Um, an, an ideal cow is, is probably 1,300, a, a working cow. Our cows are a little heavy. We have 1,600 and 1,800 pound cows too. We have a couple that won't fit through our chute. So, Fortunately, we have other ways to, to uh, restrain them in the headlocks and halters. But those animals that are that big are, are, are former show animals as this one. So their docility is a rating that we use and how docile an animal is. And we strive for docile animals here because, as I said, we have two young girls that work with these animals. Those are our daughters. And we have other kids that come to the farm. And um, so docility is very important to us here. Uh, but they can get big and they will fill this chute right up. And when we move to the next spot in the barn, we'll see a mama cow that averages about, she's weighing about 1,500 pounds um, with her calf. So this is a, one of this year's uh, calves. We have a total of, there's, there's 12 of them we kept on this farm this year. We had a tremendous run on, on the heifers as Gene talked about. And we keep these replacement heifers because our genetic program uh, is artificial, as I said, without the bull. So we use bulls from all around the world and bring them in here and breed them to our cows. And with that uh, program, we get some really good heifer calves and we will raise them up to be mountain cows. We do market some cows to people at sales so they can start their herd or raise animals in their herd um, at, at different sales. So. Great. Jean, are there any questions on the side of the classroom right now? No, nothing. I really kind of typed in. Um, there are some that we can go over later, but since we have a couple of minutes, one of the questions was, are cows on special diets based on the needs from the consumers? Um, the cows... And this is, the question is from um, Herc Marbosi. The, the cows are on special diets at different times in their life. The, we, we feed grain when we wean our calves. When this, this calf knows what grain is because before she was taken from her mother, the most stressful time in an animal's life is when they're weaned. And we feed grain before that so they get to know what it is. And then when we take them away from their mothers, they will get grain and that becomes their comfort food. And also they know what grain is and they know how to use a feed bunk and different things. But um, so at different times, the, the animals require different things. When we finish animals, um, we, we, we feed with corn and uh, cornmeal and different grains and oats, uh, which we sometimes raise on the farm here, um, and barley, and we feed a mix, and that helps with the marbling and the meat, what you see in the steaks and the muscling, et cetera. Um, and and uh, so we, we work, work on, on, on different rations at different times. Um, if, if somebody asked me if our animals are grass-fed, I would say 95% of the time they are, but they certainly get grain. Um, there is, there is plenty of reasons to feed grain and use grain, and, and we do that for those purposes. We'll show the, the steer afterwards that is getting corn right now and cornmeal um, for finishing. Uh, we do that approximately 90 days before on this farm. When we finish, we, most of our, our animals are sold, but we finish on this farm a couple of animals every year for our own freezer. And I, I, I do sell, we market what we call a freezer trade, 
which is many people will come to us and want to buy right from the farm and they will buy a half or a quarter of an animal and those animals we finish here and so we use the corn corn and the cornmeal and the, the the grain mix with minerals at the end so um, all right, Jean, with that, we're going to take a minute to rearrange ourselves and we're going to show an actual calf and its mother before being weaned. Okay, and we're going to go in the, to the New York map real quick. Dan's going to flip over to that while you do the movement. And uh, we're going to kind of show exactly where everybody is. So if you look smack dab in the orange area right in the middle, you'll see Cayuga. Um, that, that is where the location of Dan's farm is in Cayuga County, right there. So look, knowing where you all are, we, we've got some in Oneida County, we have some down in uh, Western New York, and as, as well as on Long Island there, or Staten Island area. Sorry about that, I know there's a big difference. Um, you can kind of see exactly where we all are. There's 62 counties in New York State. Wyoming County, which is in the orange there um, to the left, that is our top dairy cow producing state with 47,000. And our top beef cow producing state is Stu Ben, which is in the bottom of the um, kind of the bluish, light blue area there in southern um, New York there. Uh, so you can kind of see, yeah, when you get closer to the city, there's not a lot. There's still a lot of beef production in, in pretty much all 62 counties for the most part. Um, but those are the high concentrations and a lot has to do with the land mass and being able to produce corn so we can feed the animals. And uh, one of the questions that we'll ask Tim when he comes back is, uh, and this again, a question from Herkimer is like, what is the average um, cost to raise a cow from birth to its life cycle um, prior to being processed? Because some producers are able to produce their own feed. Some may have to buy their own feed. So it gets, it can get expensive. And the fact that, you know, we don't have a lot of grass finished farmers here in the state because we have a little issue with white stuff that's gonna be falling on our land pretty soon called snow. And uh, so that's why they do a lot of hay cutting uh, in the summertime, but do, you know, nothing beats green grass. So. Uh, we do have a small niche of grass uh, finish people, but um, for the most part, we do do some of the, that grain aspect of it. And we are a big cow-calf state. So oftentimes when that animal gets big enough, we'll ship it to the Midwest where they can go on grass uh, or finished off on grain. All right, Tim and uh, Catherine, are you ready yet? We are. All right, let's go. Let's so we can see that our, our little calf keeps hiding there behind her mama cow. But Tim, can you talk real quick about this calf and when she was born and um, tell a little bit about her mama as well? This mama cow was born in uh, 2015. Um, this is her uh, second, second, third calf. Second calf, I'm sorry. I'm losing dates here. She is one of our heavier cows. We, we fed her a little bit of that comfort food grain right now so she would stand still for, for the video. So she's here eating this. Um, she's a heavier cow, she's about 1,500 pounds. The calf she has with her on the other side was born <clears throat> September 1st, and that is a little heifer calf, and I will get her around in a second so you can see her. But the mama cow, when the calf is born, most of the time, 95% of the time, they, they take care of that process themselves. They don't go to a hospital. We put them in these pens in here. We call them maternity pens. And when, when the cow's getting close, we will pen the, the cow up and we will check her two, three, four times a day um, and, and see where they're at. We're looking at putting cameras in the barn this winter so that we can be in the house and see what's happening out here with the cows. Um, the cow, we don't assist a lot with the birth, but if we have to, uh, we have most of the tools here, and the vet is a phone call away. We have had a couple where we've had to assist and help uh, deliver the calf. Um, most of the time, it's on their own. Within an hour after the calf is born, that calf is up and nursing. They will be standing up right away, and they will be nursing on the mama cow going after their colostrum, which is the most important nutrient that any calf can get. Any cow, anywhere, colostrum is the number one thing. And why that is important is the mother produces all these antibiotics that the calf didn't get while she was inside. And once the calf comes out into the world, 
all of the the the, the antigens, the, the the antibiotics that the mother had. I shouldn't say antibiotics. It's a antibodies. It's antibodies that the mother had um, are passed to the calf through that colostrum to help the calf fend off disease. Um, we will come out here and, and, and help uh, dry the calf off if we have to, um, if the mother's not doing it. But most of the time, the mother takes care of it herself. She will lick the calf clean and dry and help the calf stimulate it to stand up on its legs and take off after that milk. Um, the, the, <clears throat> the calves, when they're born, we have a protocol here. We, we, we give them a, a, a three-way internasal vaccine to help with respiratory problems. Um, we also dip their navel, which is basically their belly button, with a, 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 an iodine solution to help dry it up and seal it off because that was their lifeline when they were inside the mother. And so when they come out, that's exposed. Um, and then we just make sure everything's okay. And if the calf's up and going after the mother, we will stand back and get out of the way. Um, if not, we will assist. Uh, we try not to milk cows. These are not dairy cows, these are beef cows. Um, they produce milk like a dairy cow, just not in volumes. The genetics on this animal is designed for the meat. Uh, the genetics on the dairy cow are designed for the milk. And the dairy cow will be a taller cow with more legs and a little thinner, but she will produce a lot more milk. Um, I know there was a question on the, the amount of milk and, and, and et cetera, this cow, when she's born, the calf's born, the mama will produce an abundant amount, the calf will start nursing, and then the mama is a variable. As the calf requires more milk, <clears throat> the mama will require more nutrients, hence better hay, better grass, to help um, produce the milk that the calf needs. Now this calf, being uh, almost two months old now, um, is using a little more milk. She's, as you can see, looking at some grain, and thinking about it. She does nibble on hay, she eats grass, so she eats other things besides her mother's milk. Um, and then at the six month mark, the, the cow will start slowing down on the milk, um, but that's her, her, her max production. And <clears throat> she is um, at the point of thinking of the weaning process. And at, at six months, we have to kind of slow it down, the mom will kind of slow it down, and, and will adjust the ration or the feed that the animal gets, the mama cow, and maybe take her back to some, some first cutting hay, some more burned out grass, and uh, then we can wean the, the calf off. So um, the milk production is, uh, is part of it too. Great. So we want to show one last stop on the farm here. I'm just going to turn around really quick, and we're going to try to show you what uh, some finished cattle look like. And Tim can talk a little bit about the actual beef production. As he said, most of the animals here on the farm are more for breeding purposes. And their, their main goal isn't for the finished beef that you say you would buy in the store. This, this, this steer behind me here, um, I'll try to get out of the way. He is roughly uh, 1,000 to 1,100 pounds right now. He, he, uh, and uh, he will be a freezer, freezer beef for our personal use at the farm here. Um, and, and half of him is, is something we marketed to, to family friends. Um, so he was born, uh, actually, <laughs> he is out of the cow that we were just looking at. This is her calf from last year. Um, he was born in the uh, August of last year and out of the cow that has the heifer calf this year. So he's a little over a year old. Um, we, we, we strive for animals at the 16 to 17 month mark for a finished carcass weight of about 1300 pounds would be the ideal weight. Um, the variable will go between uh, 12 to 1400 pounds live weight, I, I correct myself. The carcass weight is the weight on the rail. And uh, if we have a seven to 800 pound carcass weight, that would be an ideal weight for us. Um, but he's, he's got a, a couple months left to finish, and he's in here with some really green, green hay and uh, corn that's fed in the bunk behind me here, and uh, cornmeal and grains. And so they'll get that twice a day over here in the bunk, and then they get to eat off of the bale that you see in the background too. 
Um, they also have clean, fresh water, the most important nutrients at all times. Um, in these pens, we, we put the water in twice a day ourselves with a hose. In the other spots, we have automatic waterers. Um, and we, we clean our water tubs probably more than most people <laughs> clean other things. And, and it's very important to us because a cow needs that clean water uh, to help with the digestion of everything else. So. And we had a pretty interesting question set in before the tour um, about how much does it cost for you to produce a steer like this? The cost for this steer um, is to, to finish him out is roughly $1,800 from the day he's born to the point when he is at the market processed. And it, it'll be an $1,800 expense, it's an average expense. Now, what, what as Gene showed the feedlot picture before, it, numbers can lower costs. So if we had more animals to finish, um, our cost per animal would go down. But because we have um, just a couple, that cost per animal is higher. And that equals out about the, uh, the market weight of the animal. It'd be about $4, $4.10 a pound is the cost to produce that beef on, on, on the animal behind me. So, so real quick, Tim, how much will he weigh when he goes to process and how much meat will be available for the consumer? Oh, you've got to ask me that question. <laughs> no, he will weigh roughly, we're, we're shooting for 12 to 1300 pounds when he goes okay. to process. When he right, hangs me, rail, I can help you out a little bit if you want. So if it's about 12 to 1400 pounds, correct? 1400 pounds? Yes. I, so, I'm going to ask guests, don't, don't help me yet, let me guess, four, four to 500 pounds of meat. Yeah, about 540-ish pounds of meat, yes. Yes, yes, yes. So they, you have to remember that there's going to be bones and there's the hide and the internal organs and everything that is something that is separate. So an actual meat, meat consumption available will be about... 500 to 560 pounds based on the size of the animal when it goes to harvest. And, and our animals, uh, where we have them processed, they, they utilize every part of it that they can. The hides are all sold to uh, different leather uh, manufacturers, etc. So we use a lot of bits and pieces of that animal. The only thing that's left is the moo we often joke about, but the hides are used for something that we were just watching on TV, I'm sure, yesterday, footballs and baseballs, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So um, there is uh, the, everything is used to, in resources. The uh, collagen is used in, uh, for gelatins and you know, all that good stuff. Um, I'd like to take the time now. Tim, you did a phenomenal job. We're very excited. I'm sure that along the way we've had some questions and Dan's going to open it up to everyone to ask some questions of you right now. We're going to go in order that we introduced everybody. So we're going to start with Herkimer Bosies and then we're going to go to West, uh, Western Suffolk. So Herkimer, um, as I bring you to the screen, does anybody have any questions for um, Tim? Yes. So what's your question? Do dairy cows produce milk excessively? So the question was, do dairy cows produce milk excessively? Excessively. Um, they, no, they produce milk what their genetic makeup is, just like our beef cows. And that's why I spoke of the genetics that we use artificial to, to get the ideal animal in, in the correct amount of time with the most uh, usable beef and the same is with milk they use genetics to produce the most milk that they can out of an animal and there is variables you'll have cows that will produce 60 pounds a day and you'll have cows that will produce 100 pounds a day and, and there's different variables but excessively no um they're, they're very we're, we sit in dairy country here uh, we sit in the middle of some of the largest dairy farms in new york state right around us and they they actually buy uh, feed from me. They buy corn and stuff. Um, and it's not excessive amounts. Uh, it's, it's what the animal is allowed and what her genetic makeup is. It's very important. So uh, I wouldn't call it excessive. Right. And, and also emphasize that a beef cow's milk is strictly for that calf, like you mentioned before, where dairy cows is produced for the consumer. Correct. 
Very good. I'm going to go on to Wester Suffolk with Carrie Education on Deck. Wester Suffolk, do you have any questions of, of Tim? I, I will fill in one thing. <laughs> we get a question, do we name our cows? Our cows, our registered cows, yes, they do have names. Um, some do and some don't. Um, the, the, the kids, we, we put it out to on, on Facebook when we have calves sometimes and let people name them. Um, we, we do try to name our cows, but uh, the number is the most important thing for the documentation records. Very good. And uh, Carrier Education in Angola, do you have any questions? I love the chef jackets. I know. Nice and sharp. You guys look very professional. Any questions? <laughs> How much does it cost for a half cow? I'm sorry, what? How much does it cost for a half cow? What's the cost of a half cow? <laughs> Our mama cow had a, a big mooing spree right when you were talking. What was the question, Jean? How much um, is a half cow? How much? Oh, so when you sell a oh, finished sell effort. A finished cow. Um, when we sell from the farm, we, we sell roughly about $4.70 a pound. Um, yeah. per, so the half of a cow will, will roughly run. Uh, it, it's a variable depending on the hanging weight but from 12 to $1,800. Okay. And now uh, Port Richmond in Staten Island, do you have any questions? Actually, we had the same question uh, on how much uh, the cow is sold, or if it's sold by a price or per pound. The, the price per pound on the beef? Is that what I'm hearing? You sell yeah. Other, you sell, we actually answered the question before we So, the But I think that's a good point. So, um, Tim touched upon how he had about $1,800 in that steer to start with, right? right? And if you're selling each half for about, what did you say? Roughly twelve to $1,800. But I, I don't want to get the misconception um, of, of, of the, the, the profit because the one thing in that $1,800 was the, the processing fees. Um, it's not in the $1,800 $1, of the cost. That's the cost to raise the animal. The, the fee for the, the, the processing of the butcher shop and the slaughterhouse and everything. We, we use a certified USDA slaughterhouse with a federal inspector there. And that runs us 95 cents a pound to have that animal processed. Um, it runs roughly $95 for the, the kill process. Um, so by the time you're said and done, I, I, when people are asking these questions, they're looking at say $3,600 is what I, what I sell a, a steer behind me for. I also pay the processing fees. So when my fee goes through at $4.70 a pound on the hanging weight, there's no processing fee to my customers that I sell to. So uh, the processor definitely uh, makes money to stay in business um, and, and, and they charge different fees. There is variables and different ways to do it, but we like to use a federal stamp that way, there's a federal inspector that looks at all of our carcasses. The other thing Great, that we have, to, we have to remember is that oftentimes the producer, the farmer, does not include his labor. That is something that is just kind of a given where here you are getting paid by the hour to do your job, whether it's salary or whether it's hourly. And a producer oftentimes does not configure his labor in there. Um, no. to keep the cost of the production. That's, that's something that uh, we, we were working on in New York in, with different groups through Cornell and different programs. Is, uh, the other thing is the producer doesn't actually know the cost. And I'm, I'm not an expert on it either. I don't have all of my costs nailed down to a T, too. Um, and it's very tough to because those costs are variable every year with market prices, with grains, with fuel, um, with equipment repairs. Um, we, we have a full line of equipment that supports these animals and that costs money to maintain that equipment. Um, so I, I believe, and I wanna speak for a lot of producers in New York State, they don't know their actual cost. And uh, that's a hard number to find. And there's a lot of research that's still done on it to this day through the universities. Um, so the $1,800 that I gave you is a very uh, estimate rough cost. Um, 
and that was some, some uh, research out of the Midwest. Um, and it also varies in different parts of the country. Okay, real quick, we've got a couple more classes and then there's a, a posted question. Oneida Herkimer Bosey's in New Hartford. Do you have any questions? It looks like they might have sent in two questions, Jean. Um, so I'll read them off to you, Tim. How does the farmer keep the bale type from getting moldy, especially with the inclement met weather in New York State? We talked about that. We, we, this year we were very fortunate. We baled almost 400 round bales of dry hay. Um, in years that we don't, we have an option, and those are the big white marshmallows that we see. We call them baleage. Um, if the weather is not working with us, we will make baleage. Um, we try and we play a big gamble every time we mow hay as to whether it's going to rain or not. We watch the weather very closely. Um, the internet is a great source. It's on our phones. Um, we'll get it off the TV. We'll get three different sources. And then we make a call whether to mow or not. And this year we were very fortunate. If we do get hay that's rained on with beef cows, the quality isn't as important as with dairy. So if it gets rained on, we just work to get it dried out again um, with the sun. Um, if we do get moldy hay, this bale behind me was baled a little bit too damp. We were gonna try to make square bales out of these, but the rain was coming. So I made the decision to bale it at a higher moisture of about 18%. It is a little bit moldy. Um, does not bother the beef cows. You couldn't feed it to horses. That's why we didn't make it into square bales. Thanks, Tim. I've got uh, another question from GST Bosies real quick. If you want to pop around. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's ask the question. I'm Anna. Hi, oh. Anna. <laughs> <laughs> How many cows do you send to the finishing farm each year? Um, our, our, our number of calves would be the thing, and, and our average, we, we have 30 mama cows, so we get about 30 calves. Um, it, this year is a very low number because we had an incredible amount of heifers um, that we kept for replacements because some of our cows are getting up to that 14 year mark, so those cows will not be producing calves anymore. Um, on the average, I will give you a number of about 15 calves from this farm. Perfect. Um, they do not all go from this pen. We will sell them as feeders. Two other um, questions I can see here, Jean. Um, yeah, hold on. One, one question from Catherine. Hold on one second. Okay. We, we need to go on to, we've got one more school we need to hit and out of the questions before we go to that list right there. Um, we have Southwest Vermont. Do you have any questions? Vermont, I went to college in Vermont. Randolph Center, Vermont Technical okay. College. All right, and let's go back to then, um, if, uh, if uh, Vermont doesn't have any questions, let's go back to Wildwood. Oh, you do have a question, Vermont? What is it, please? I'm sorry, you're gonna have to come up to the microphone or to the computer because you can't hear you. Pesticides. You guys use herbicides or pesticides in the pastures? Yes, yes we do. We, we use a limited amount of herbicides. We don't use many pesticides. Um, we don't have a big bug problem here. That goes back to our stewardship. Our earthworms are great. We love earthworms. We try to promote them. Um, the biggest thing we use is uh, rotating crops. Um, we rotate on our crop ground between corn, soybeans, wheat, oats, um, and, and we rotate those around. So that controls the weeds better than all straight herbicides. But we do use herbicides. Um, and on a limited amount, uh, just enough to control the weeds. Uh, because they're costly, there's no doubt about it. Uh, herbicides and pesticides cost a fair amount of money and that goes into the cost to produce everything. So uh, we use what we need to control it and that's it. We don't uh, use extra. We work with a crop consultant on this farm uh, very intensely um, for the amount of fertilizer we put down. We test our soil samples uh, so that we put the right amount down because uh, their grazing plan, which it's all based around, uh, requires us to keep, it's not a, a CAFO plan, but it's an intense nutrient management plan. And so we're monitoring them all the time. But it is a tool that we, we utilize on this farm. Tim, am I correct in saying you use that mostly on your crop land, not your pasture, or do you also use it on your pastures? We do not use any um, herbicides on our pastures. Um, we grow legumes and we go grasses. So we have clover and we have alfalfa along with grasses out there in, in our pastures. 
And the only herbicides we could use would be ones that would end up killing off our legumes, which we don't want to do. So herbicides on the pastures, no. Fertilizers, yes. Um, pesticides, we did use a, 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 a one uh, pesticide on a new seeding this year as we had a moth that came in and it was brought up by the, the southern winds and it started devouring the plants and we had to control that moth. Um, a quick question was, what is the pregnancy period for a cow? How, how many months? Nine months is their pregnancy period. And another question is, why do they castrate the bulls? We castrate the bulls. Uh, the number one, we talk about docility, uh, control. It, it, a, a bull is an unstable animal as a mama cow, but it also helps with the growth of the animal for meat production. So we steer the animals um, so that they're not putting all of their, their um, testosterone, et cetera, into producing the bull functions of the cow, which you will see a bull with a big neck and, and uh, the hump on their neck and grow right out. And the steer will be more refined. And that way, by steering them and controlling them, we, we castrate all of our young calves to um, emphasize their focus on meat production. Um, and I, I know Anita asked what the average um, salary is of a farmer. Is that something that you're still trying to figure out? <laughs> <laughs> I have an off-farm job. We have 150 acres here. We have 30 mama cows. And if this farm could sustain myself and my family, that would be wonderful. But in today's economy, that is not possible. Um, the, the, the number of acres we would need to sustain ourselves would be a thousand. We do not have a thousand acres to grow the crops and produce the feed for a higher number of cattle to sustain the household and the family and the lifestyle that we have. So no, I have an off farm job. I work every day, uh, 40 hours in, in, in the real world. Plus I work here. Um, this farm uh, produces enough money to pay the taxes and the insurance. And my wife will tell you differently sometimes that uh, <laughs> because equipment is expensive, um, buildings are expensive, um, it, it takes a, a, a lot of money. There's no doubt about it. And a lot of our producers in New York State do work, about 85% of them do work off farm. That's, that's true, very true across the country now too. That's why the average cow-calf herd is 20 cows and that would put it in the classification of part-time. Um, right. We would go in that classification, but technically this is a full-time farm. Unfortunately, it does not make enough money to sustain itself. Right, and, uh, and uh, Dan, um, you know, if you, uh, real quickly is, yes, the average herd in New York is 20 head. The average in the United States is 100, or I'm sorry, is 40 head. 99% um, of our farms in New York are family owned. So you and your family own this farm whereas 97% in the United States um, are family owned. And then 56% uh, of the farms are uh, in the third generation. Uh, and you can see that slide right there with the average age of a farmer being 58 years old. So uh, these guys aren't getting any younger for sure. And, um, and then that hope of 64% of farmers hope to pass it on to that next generation. And because uh, it's it's not an easy job, and and that uh, bottom farmer there, that is uh, Louis Martin. He is a, a feedlot operator in Western New York. So where if Tim didn't finish off his cows, they'd probably go to Billy's. But um, I'd like to take this time because we're approaching 10 o'clock, and I know um, pretty much this is closing things up. And uh, very much appreciate your time and energy, Tim not only to do this uh, virtual tour today. I, I, I appreciate everybody coming on from the schools and I want everybody to know if you visit the Finger Lakes, we are always open. Um, you are more than welcome to stop and get a personal tour at any time to this farm. That's fantastic. And if there's any other questions that you may have for Tim or for the New York Beef Council, feel free to email them to us and we will be more than happy to answer them or have Tim answer them um, via email and uh, you know, get what you need. And if there's anything you need from us or further information, please give us a call here at the Beef Council or email Catherine or myself. We will be more than happy to help you um, and give you the information that you are looking for. Um, anything else, uh, Tim, Catherine, as you uh, wrap up on the farm? No, I want to thank everybody for signing on and listening to me talk today. And Catherine working diligently with the technology to make it work in this old uh, barn.